really not a lot to talk about this week, so I'll try and keep it short. But over on Patreon right now, you can see the first two parts of my Kamen Rider Double Review up there for just $1. $1 access is all Patreon posts, which will be distributed out onto um, Daily Motion first a week after they're up there, and 10 days after posting on Patreon um, on my YouTube page. YouTube is usually three days after I put something on Daily Motion. That's how I've been getting it pretty consistent this year. I've missed one or two where the scheduling thing for YouTube didn't work, so I had to post them late. That that, that, that happens. Anyways, Excited 37. We finally get Tattle Legacy's premiere, and less awe-inspiring than I thought it was going to be. I mean, I didn't expect all the bells and whistles to it, but it's... I think it might have been... It was necessary for progressing the arc, but it doesn't feel very um, dramatic for Kagami finally to have a resolve to get past its usage limitation, and then it's just, like, freaking there. I mean, I know it's a palette swap and modification of Tattle Fantasy's armor, but it still looks really good with how they, mo with how they modified it. The faceplate now sleeping and golden, the armor overall white the demonic features and characteristics swapped out for angelic ones. It's like, it's like Haseo third form going to Haseo X form in how one's the scorpion-like demonic reaper and then you got him transformed into the angel of death. There's a contrast in both the col the differences in the color scheme and the aesthetic um, style changes. The stylistic aesthetic change, I'm forgetting the exact phrase I want to use to describe it, but, like, wings instead of horns and all that. It makes it look much better and a lot more distinct from Tale of Fantasy. And yes, I know it's recycled from the movie, so you finally get the movie prop months late, and you already have it built for you, so why not use it in the show? I get that. It's just that for, for the progression of Gagami's character and the arc they've built for him, and how how it's likely going to go, where they're, they have him swaying between um, what Saki's left repeating endlessly and what um, Masemune wants him to actually do and commit to. Uh, commit sins in the name of getting her back versus um, what Saki wanted her, him to be with all of her being to the point even when she's brainless, that's all she's left repeating. So, you got the good angel and devil, the shoulder angel and shoulder devil ones, and whether it's um, hypocritical for him to bear that form, or if he's going to live up to the um, intents of the form he's possessed, he now possesses, is definitely interesting. Um... So yeah, it fits. It's just that I think it, I think his premiere was kind of lame. It's like he's now he, he's now facing paradox and kicking his ass. So even if say um, Emu loses his powers, then um, he should be able to fight pretty much everything um, except Kronos, including Kronos. I haven't seen the stat board for uh, Brave Level One Hundred. I presume it's almost on par with Kronos and. He could use Muteki's invincibility feature for 10 seconds, so he'd be able to counter uh, him to at least disable, um, like, destroy uh, Masamune's driver. But, no way to know where that's going right now. Um, but yeah, that was pretty much the first part of the episode. Uh, Masamune telling Kagami to eliminate Exide and... And, okay, I liked this bit uh, with Masamune in that he compromised with Kagami to get him to do what he wanted, in that Kagami outright straight refused to kill someone in cold blood because he's a doctor. He saves lives. And then Masamune's like, well, okay, then kill Paradox then. And that makes sense. I mean, um, Paradox has already shown himself to rebel from um, Masamune's attempts to control both sides, and since he's lost his Bugster Enforcer, the now level 100 Kagami should have a decent free reign in eliminating him. Um, of course, um, 
Kagami is still being manipulated meant, uh, through Masamune not telling him that uh, Saki's safe data, the reason they haven't gotten her back fully, is in Graphite. Nobody has men even mentioned that to them. So I'm thinking this is still headed towards the tragedy route where Saki might be the only one they end up not recovering, as Graphite in the episode in his human form is continuing to deteriorate uh, health-wise, as they've got, like, glitching effects, and um, his actor is real sweaty and disheveled, and he looks like he's sick, so it's kind of... It's kind of obvious he's propagating um, Game Deus's infection still within him, even though the infection spore they tried on Kronos so while ago has long left him. It's like a side infection, or maybe this is Game Deus's way out of the of being trapped behind the firewall of needing all the other bugsters haven't been defeated. He He's going to create the condition where all the bugsters are defeated, but, yeah, um, no longer limited by the game realm's rules. That might be where they're going with that. Anyways, so since Masamune has a more reasonable ultimatum, and since he's meant to defeat bugsters anyways, that, that seems like a good compromise for him, and even if even if it buys into Masamune's ultimate plan of getting Emu and his Muteki powers off the board so he can continue his worldwide domination of Kamen Rider Chronicle. Um, this segues into the um, Kamen Rider Chronicle Bugster Infection Patient of the Week, and it's Saki's father, who started playing uh, Kamen Rider Chronicle to try and see if that could help free Saki after her disappearance. Um, I'd like to learn the logic of that, because to the outside world, um, the early Gain Syndrome patients weren't connected to um, Connor Chronicle at all. It's like, you was, it, I would think that they would believe it would only be connected to just those who disappeared playing the game, not people who disappeared before that. So the logical framework for why... Saki's father would be a, a player is a bit head-scratchy to me. I, um, I mean, it's not like Kagami's father, the director of the hospital, who's in on all the uh, not-public information about Game Syndrome that a couple episodes ago he, it was revealed he attempted to be a Chronicle player for the same reason, save Saki, and uh, win, in his case, win back Hero's smile, because... Saki's laws affected all of these people. And it's it's good, but it takes up a l so little of the episode. I don't know, maybe the guy will be back in the next episode or so, but it feels like a waste that there was no real interaction between him and Kagami. And I hate to keep doing it. I hate to keep going back to this long-standing criticism I've had of Exide, but you really should have... Not you as in the people watching this, but they, 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 that's a better phrase, way to phrase it, the people making Excite really should have shot more with Saki's actress, as there's several scenes in here where um, both Taiga and Kagami are flashing back to the incident that effectively changed their lives with the failure and loss involved in it, and it's just... It's so little content that they can play pretty much the full... Well, not, every, not the entire thing, but it feels like the entire thing is. There was so little of it in the episode that gave us those details, and that is, of course, hinging on my earlier criticism of the show, and with the pace of, it, of Excite originally being terrible in the first, like, 12 episodes, and that is definitely a consequence of this now, because even though you have her actress, they've taken no time to try and, like, shoot a bit more of that flashback -y footage for informing more of the relationship there. Like, um, I've, re I've used this reference before, but, like, Ren and, uh, damn it, now I'm forgetting the name of Ren's girlfriend and Ryuki, but something like that. Uh, something where, like, 
they have the actress, and they just have her saying the same line over and over again, so... Why not shoot just one other, one other thing, one other interaction between them to kind of inform the direction in which this is heading, since they're just repeating all of it anyways. Or, uh, not repeating, e calling back to it and echoing the prior encounters to lead into Kagami finally coming to a decision in the next episode. So... Yeah, it's continuing my is my just my issue there. Um, Muteki fights one of the mid-tier bugsters again when it re-manifests and uh, to get rid of Saki's father's game syndrome. And I liked the shortened bit of how Muteki transforms. Personally, I would have just had it's pretty much adding on to the activation sequence for um, um, Maximum Mighty X. It's just that it immediately shoots him out of the armor and the armor vanishes. Personal, which echoes back to the full transformation sequence from last week, where it's just showing him jump, uh, being shot on a gold glow, stars gather around him, and he's fully transformed. I think it might have been better, however, for the shortened version to, like, he's gobbled up by Max and Mighty, uh, Max and Mighty goes glowed, glows gold, and then it breaks apart like the, um, level one forms did for the other riders, or for, um, going from Mighty Brothers level 10 to Mighty Brothers level 20. The armor shattering apart to showcase the more agile and stronger rider form, because... That would call back to the uh, to these prior SDE forms in uh, to make it more cohesive with how all of these transformations have gone. You got the weaker SD form that's better suited for um, curing uh, initial bu um, initial form bugster infections. Then you cast it all off and it, uh, burst to reveal the more Agile and powerful rider form. I think I just repeated myself, didn't I? I hate it when I do that. So yeah, aesthetically, there's nothing wrong with how they did this, as it matches the um, cutaway version of things. Is that it seems like it was a bit slower and more effect heavy when the shattering apart thing would have done just as well. Muteki continues to have an excellent showing, as it sh um, it also reveals that Emu isn't fully aware of all of Muteki's powers or the abilities it grants him. He kind of quantizes around the bugster um, this time. Quantizes in um, quant yeah, quantum teleportation. God, I hate the movie. I, get, I hate Southland Tales. And that, that, that phrase always makes me think of that movie. Um, yeah, that's pretty much where Tattle Legacy's debut coincides, and the battle is cut off by Taiga and, not so much Taiga, but Nico interceding as she wants to actually kick Paradox's ass, and Taiga holds her back because he understands what Kag Kagami wants, and of course, everybody's supportive of him like they were before because he, Kagami, is a freaking idiot about this. Has been a consist consistently a freaking idiot about this. I mean, the only, the only reason Saki's in danger now is because Masamune wants things done and he's threatening to kill her. But he wouldn't be threatening to kill her had he never signed on to the initial deal before. Hell, Masamune would be powerless at this point if he hadn't intervened and sided with him. And, you know, they would have had the proto shots regardless had they done that. And, you know, things would be farther along in the progression to... Um, ending this conflict once and for all. I mean, they'd be lacking Muteki, but they would have Kronos on their side by someone else using the Gashots, or... Okay, yeah, no one else could use the Gashot because of the conditions behind Kronos' um, activation thing with having immunity to all the Bugster uh, DNA. Just forget I... Infections. For Just forget I mentioned that I blanked on that detail for a moment. So, but they would still have all the Proto-Gashots, um... Admittedly, uh, Kyria would still be in Proto Bakuso Bike, but it wouldn't be like he'd be dead. Okay, he still would have technically been dead, but it's not like 
he would have been really, really dead. I mean, I'm glad to have him back, but if it was a choice between uh, some of the stupid plot points of the last few episodes and that, eh. Speaking of Kyria, that's the next detail that this episode gave us. The other victims of the Bugster virus stored in the Proto-Gashots are security locked by the Master Commoner of Chronicle Gashots, so they need to retrieve it from Masamune, which means they need to kick Masamune's ass. And I like the fight that they have in attempting to get his Gashot from him, where it's Muteki, um, Laser Level Zero, and, unexpectedly, Kamen Rider Poppy. Asuna has not gotten much time in her rider suit, so it was nice to see her, and her and Kiri are about on the same power tier right now between her level zero and her bugs to form self, but I wonder if fighting with her is possibly suppressing her power at all because she's fighting alongside someone whose pres mere presence is reducing her power level because of the Proto Gashad's abilities. I, I know... We saw before with, um, with Genom level zero that his mere presence weakened Paradox's ability to affect Emu, um, externally through his Game Syndrome infection, and it was then contact that lowered his power rating to something more manageable by the other riders. So, it's not quite doing that, but could that potentially what might end up happening if the two fight together too much? Or am I just overthinking this since Poppy is is effectively known and become a benign bugster, so her bugster power doesn't so much isn't so concerning relative to everything else. These are the things I think about when I discuss these series. Um that is all held off, however, when Masamune um, gloats that he sends um, Kagami off to just kill Paradox, and once that happens, Emu no longer has powers, he's no longer to save people. And I'm thinking, when they say that and think of that as the priority, um, they have another pe enough people that if Kronos goes down for good, if they steal his Gashas, then... Hell, they can probably just do another compatibility surgery to make Emu actually capable of using the gamer driver normally without having to worry about all that. I mean, um, we were pretty certain that after Muteki's initialization, he no longer needs his, like, the Genius Gamer M part of himself to actually trigger it again and take the power up to the next level. And even without that mentality, he didn't switch personalities in this battle. It's his normal self that's in control the entire time, it's not like he's going to use all of his combat knowledge or gaming memory, he's just, he doesn't have the god moding of Genius Gamer N, which he doesn't need anymore because he's literally got god mode enabled by Hyper Muteki. So, what's the conflict here of actually taking para, uh, Paradox out of um, service? I mean, is the... Um, or hell, we've seen how the Bugster infection writes itself fully into Emu's DNA. Would Killing Paradox even do anything for his game syndrome overall, Since, especially since he's patient zero of this, where it seems more like it's amalgamated into him? So, what? Since living with it so long, I would think he would have built up a natural immunity that would have allowed him to, say, use more of use more Bugster gear than, um, not Bugster gear, use more of the gamer driver equipment than anyone else. So, yeah, um, I'm not exactly seeing the, um, same thing they all are in the story with how they place emphasis on saving Paradox before, um, dealing with everything else. Because they know, one way or another, that To Clear Common or Chronicle they gotta be Paradox. So, when going up against Game Deus to actually completely, completely clear the game, Emu is not going to be an option for them to, um, to have on their side fighting everything, which means it would be reliance on everyone else to chip in and do that. So, I'm thinking 
what's the holdup? If you get up, if you get rid of Paradox while at the same time eliminating Kronos, you still have Graphite. Graphite is still the placeholder before being able to take on Game Deus to clear the game. You could, um, you could do that compatibility surgery in that time as any uh, Genom, uh, any Genom Corporation resources that might be required for the game, the compatibility surgery would be freed up by Masamune going back in bar, back behind bars. That would be open as a resource to them again, since, well, Kuroto's on their sides, and he has to have tons of back doors into the company, or hell, the, um, guy who, um, created Bergermon, uh, and the, uh, forgetting that level four gosh shots, Juju Burger, I, I would think he would be able to get them the help they needed since that he was the instrumental in helping them develop Max, uh, Maximum Mighty X for all that. So yeah, I don't see what the show is trying to present yet with this moral quandary. And in fact, it would seem like it would only get worse um, for, uh, the closer they get to Game Deus propagating out of Graphite in his entirety. Unless, you know, they kind of finally convince Paradox to switch sides and not try and kill Emu, which more and more is looking like less of a possibility in the future. But we get to the climax of the episode with um, Paradox versus Brave Level 100 Round 2, and we see Taiga come in. Now, I think this is another flaw with the episode in that we're really not getting much into Taiga's head in these things, but it's more telling through his actions that um, with the salvation of Saki on the table, he's seeing this as his own personal redemption to his failure to defeat Graphite before. So while, um, so while Kagami is focused on Paradox, he tries and to use his level 50 form to defeat Graphite level 99, and he gets his ass handed to him hard. It's like, you can see the the ferociousness that Taiga's trying to face uh, face him with, but it's simply not enough against the full power Crimson Dragon. So, yeah, this is the worst off we've seen someone in in Common Rider for a while now. It's like even hell, especially with how ghosts tend to press the reset button on people's damage because. Ghosts and Spirits. I think the last time we saw someone this bad off was, um, post-freeze Super Evolution Shinosuke, like, right after he got hit by everything that, um, uh, the Super Evolved Freeze had to throw at, throw at him, like, and that pretty much killed Shinosuke, so, and as the next episode previous revealed, um, Taiga's life is fully on the line here, so their depiction of things um, actually is pretty good for showing how severe it is. They even have him coughing up, slash, they say it's vomiting, but it's pretty much coughing up blood from punctured wounds. And, you know, people complain about how they do the chest, the, like, the chest wraps with the, it's, with the one band over the shoulder to, uh, to denote heavy injury. That's how you wrap um, bruised ribs, broken ribs. That's actually how you're supposed to do that. So it's, so it's actually, if it's something that's denoting more severe injuries, that's what you're supposed to do in those circumstances if you take chest wounds like that. And, um, this episode shows exactly what those wounds would look like before treatment for those kinds of things. And in this case, in life-threatening circumstances with how Taiga, it's like, it's not take, it, take severe injuries and fall on consciousness. He's, he's groaning. He's like soft moaning. It's like, it's, it's a very effective scene to sell the drama of someone's life be, uh, uh, going on the line. And in Kagami's case, it's from his perspective, the outsider looking in of what he's supposed to be doing. And yet it's, it's directed at 
someone who he's hated for years because of how he failed to save uh, the love of his life that he's now on the cusp of saving himself. And the only reason he's in that condition is wanting redemption for his parts in that loss and because he was helping uh, Kagami try and achieve it. So it's definitely more pushing him towards this ultimate line where he decides who he is. Is he a pawn? Is he a doctor? Is he going to regret retrieving his girlfriend if he actually achieves it? Or is he going to own up to his mistakes and finally do things the right way? It's pretty... Um, pretty engaging, all things considered, even though not a lot is happening. It's just three things. The first battle, the revelation about everybody being locked up in the proto shots, and then uh, Graph right at the end. I said this was going to be short, and it ended up not being short at all. Ugh. Okay. Um, I don't think we have any interruptions in airing for the rest of the year, for re the rest of the series. We're in, like, last six to eight episodes of the show, so who knows how they're going to wrap it up. Yep, that's all I got. See you all next week.